Hey everyone, welcome back to another Tic Tac Taiko. As promised, I'm gonna start doing some Katsugi Okero content on my channel. This week we're gonna start with the hit and the fit, the two most important aspects when it comes to Katsugi Okero playing. What are the hit and the fit? You'll have to stick around to find out. Well, I'm not gonna make you wait until much later in the video to tell you that the hit is everything to do with the bachi that you're using for Katsugi Okero. And the fit is everything to do with how you wear the Katsugi Okero on your body. Understanding how these two things can work for or against you can drastically improve or hinder your Katsugi Okero technique. And until you can master these two elements, it doesn't really matter how fast your hands are, or how much you can move with the Okero, or even how much you can entertain the audience with your body language and your expressions. Everything is so much harder until you understand the hit and the fit. If you like what you're hearing so far, if you want more Katsugi Okero comment, let me know with a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed, well, you should. We'll start with the hit. But to do that, I need us to take a step back away from Katsugi Okero and onto pretty much any other style of taiko. We'll start with naname, the slanted stand. Because I am taller, I'm going to have longer bachi to match my frame. And I've done a whole video on bachi length before. I need to step back further away to compensate for having a longer pair of bachi. And that's easy enough to do. I can pretty much match whatever I need to by moving further away or back away from the drum. But let's say I was on the opposite end of the spectrum and I'm not tall, I'm short. I can't get far away from the drum because I won't be able to reach it with my shorter bachi. So I need to get closer and maybe getting in a deep stance isn't going to work because now my, my arms are more parallel or in a weird angle. So I might need to come upright. I can adjust my stance and my distance from the drum to adjust to the drum. And then we have Katsugi Okero. And the biggest difference with Katsugi Okero, and some of you are probably figuring out where I'm going with this, is that the drum is attached to you. It is always touching your hip. If I move away, there is no away. The drum comes with me. If I lower my stance, the drum is still here. If I raise my stance, if I try to move quickly, if I jump, everything I do is mirrored by the drum. I can't get away from it. And because I cannot adjust me relative to the drum, the only thing I can do is adjust where my arms are relative to my bachi. Now, admittedly, it's difficult to talk about the hit without talking about the fit, but it's difficult to talk about the fit without talking about the hit. So I decided to do hit first and then fit. And you'll see what I mean about having to kind of go back and forth between the two aspects. So forget the fact that I'm wearing it on a strap, just focus on the drum head and the bachi position. I'm going to tell you how I size my Okero Bachi. I have principles that follow for both the right and the left hand. And the principle is this. I want the tip of my Bachi to touch the center of the drum. I don't want to hit the center of the drum normally, but this is just about sizing, not about striking. I want to lay the Bachi flat, take the top of my fist, that part, and slide it up until I hit something. In this case, I'm touching a rope. I pull back and I've got a little bit of choke and this is great. If I'm playing regular bachi, this is going to be what it looks like normally. And most of you are familiar with this. So I want a grip that's very familiar to me. Even though the striking is different, the grip is very similar. And it doesn't mean I can't change the grip and do different things. Again, this is just sizing. As for the left hand, same principle. Now, the grip is drastically different. Don't get me wrong. But I'm not going to be talking about grip here that much. So we're going to speed through it. I've got the tip of the bachi at the center. I'm going to lay the bachi flat. Do the Vulcan, cut the bachi, slide down until I touch something, wrap the thumb around, a little bit of choke, a little bit of choke. So the grips are very, very different, but the principles are the same. And what some people might notice, especially if they take a look at my other bachi for any other style, taiko, these are ridiculously small compared, but it works. It works because the principle is sound. So because my bachi are a right length for me and this type of okedo, I can play loose, I can play fast, I can play strong because my bachi allow me to practice good technique because I'm following good principles. Now, let's compare that with what I see a lot of Katsugi Okero players doing, even those who have been playing for a long time. They're using bachi that are just too long. So let's follow my principle. Tip of the bachi, 
center of the drum, lay it flat, top of the fish slides in, I touch something, I stop, I come up, and that's too much choke, right? If I was playing Odaiko or anything, this would be too much. This is going to be counteracting every strike I do with its own weight. I don't want that. Alternatively, tip of the bachi, center of the drum, lay it flat, slide in just a little bit so I only have a little bit of choke. This looks like the normal strike, which is great, except on the okero, look how much gap there is between my fist and the rim of the drum. Way too much gap. So this is great for power strikes, but I don't need to power strike this type of okero. It's got a thin head. I'm not playing it for power. The larger okero, maybe, but I would also have different bachi. For something like this, this is overkill, especially when you factor in that your left hand has to match anything your right hand is doing. This is strong. This is never going to be as strong. And if you're wailing with the right, your left's never going to catch up. But even more basic than that, this is hard to control if I want to play really fast, really intricate. If I was able to get closer to the drum and I didn't have all of this weight at the end, it would be so much easier. As for the left hand, I mean, we're going to do it, but I think you know what's going to happen. Tip, flat, Vulcan, cut, slide, grip. Way too much choke, way too much weight to fight against. And again, the left hand is never gonna be quite as strong. The grip is way different, and for most of us, we're not left-handed. This is, this is gonna hurt a lot. As for the alternative, I mean, way less control. And your left hand needs all the advantages it can have. If you're left-handed, maybe this is more okay, but in general, you don't want this much space in between. Earlier in this video, I said if you have regular bachi and you need to step away from the drum, you simply step away from the drum, you adjust. But because you can't do that with Katsugi Okero, what I do see in reality with people that have bachi that are too long is they move their elbows or their arms or their hands away from the drum head to compensate for their long bachi. And there are people who are able to get away with it. They can play fast, they can play loud, they can do all kinds of cool things but you're disconnected from your body. And in no way, in no universe, is this easier to play than this. You can't relax anywhere near as much out as you can in. But in general, for normal, everyday Katsugi Okero playing, I can't think of a reason why you would want to use anything but the shortest possible bachi. Now I will admit, using shorter, lighter bachi means that you have to have better technique. If I want to play loud, I need to have good wrist snap. If I want to play with dynamics, I need to be able to stay loose and have good wrist snap. The bigger, longer, heavier bachi means I can hit louder easier, but I can't have evenness of dynamics anywhere near as comfortable as I can with smaller, lighter bachi. This isn't just me going, bleh, you long bachi players, what's wrong with you? Cuddle bachi should be short, nah. No. For about three years in San Jose Taiko, I had this brilliant idea that because all my other bachi were longer, my Katsugi Okero bachi should be longer too. And for those three years, I managed, but I never felt like my technique got any better. I felt like I was always being held back because I was compensating for those long bachi. Then I realized I should use smaller bachi and have never looked back since. I can, and I will admit, I can think of one good reason why you might be using longer bachi. If I'm wearing my Okedo slung low, lower than normal, I might want longer Okedo bachi. So normally, my Okedo is resting here on the upper thigh, near the hip. In this case, it's much lower. And so with my regular shorter Okedo bachi, eh, this is, this is kind of a reach. I don't feel very comfortable. I have to squeeze my arms down low to play where I want to. In this situation, the longer bachi are perfect. They reach exactly where I want them to. But my principle doesn't come into play here, and that's okay because the drum is not being played at the same angle. So while my principle works in general, sometimes different configurations will require different bachi. But it's really important to understand that you're doing it on purpose, not as a default. So if you're using longer okero bachi, and you're wearing the katsugi okero as sort of normal, not hung low, and they work better for you, please contact me. I want to have that conversation. I want to understand what it is I'm missing that I couldn't find when I was doing it. But anyways, there's the hit. Now on to the fit. A huge factor on how your Okedo is going to fit on your body is the strap. So we need to talk about what kinds of straps you might encounter and how it works with the drums you use. There are three main types of straps you'll encounter. Single pieces of fabric, clips, and Okedo straps. 
The fabric is pretty self-explanatory. You might have something that's cut specifically to be used as an Oketo strap, or you might have something that's repurposed like a furoshiki that happens to be the right size and shape and length for Oketo. As for a strap with the clip, this could be something like an actual guitar strap that's been repurposed for Oketo or something somebody jury rigged with a carabiner and it just hooks on and it works and that's fine. And the Oketo strap is something that looks a lot like this where you have a piece of rope or string or fabric that goes through either end on both sides. And while there are three types of straps, there's two ways to tie the Oketo. And that depends a lot on the strap and the Oketo. If you have an actual Oketo strap, you might find that the fabric here is able to go through the holes in the rims where the ropes are going through. But because the ropes are going through it, if the holes are too small and the ropes are too thick, you may not have any room. It really depends on the Oketo, and sometimes it's different from one hole to the next. One thing that I have found is, you know, you can have a really thick fabric here, but on my Tyco 1, the strap that I got, which did not come with a Tyco 1, this is a different separate strap, I didn't find that the length was enough with the straps, um, the ties that came with it, so I went out and bought a shoestring. So this, very thin, pretty durable, not the prettiest, but it works for home practice. And this fits through almost any hole, which is ironic because this is a Tyco one, which doesn't have holes at all. Now, if you don't have an Oketo strap, or you do, but it can't go through the holes, you're gonna to have to tie it the other way, which is fine. And that's going to be around the ropes themselves. The key here is tying it in a way that it's not gonna slide or move around as you're playing. Because having the Oketo adjust to your strap while you play is one of the worst things in the world. All of a sudden it starts to get higher and lower and tilt left and tilt right. And any of those extra little things makes Oketo playing so much more difficult. And it's already difficult. You don't need to make it worse. If you're like me, I'm not that great with knots. I just try to make a couple of knots and make it really, really tight. But over playing time, they tend to loosen up. And clips especially have trouble staying secure. They tend to want to move around as you play because they're not, they're not gripping as much as just holding on. But whatever you do, whether you've got holes that you can work with or not, the most important thing is finding a position where it's not going to move. And this takes trial and error. You'll figure this out in time. But regardless of which way you're tying it, if you're not able to tie through the holes, you wanna get as close to the rim as possible, not up here towards the center, and you wanna find something that is secure as possible. And a lot of this is just gonna take practice, finding out what works, what you thought worked, and what didn't. Welcome to the unusual angle portion of our recording. Um, this is, I think, the best angle to show how to tie Katsuki Oketo. I'm going to go through six different steps that I go through when I'm tying the strap. Step number one, hide the knots. On most regular Oketo, you're going to have two different knots. The initial knot and the secondary knot. The initial knot is what secures the rope in place so that the heads can be attached to the body. This is a very important knot. You generally don't want to touch it unless you know what you're doing. Even if you know what you're doing, we don't need to touch it for tying the strap. The secondary knot is generally easy to spot as it has a lot of the excess rope. And as you can see, this is not the prettiest side of the Oketo. There's just a lot going on. As opposed to any other part of the Oketo, which you know generally is nice and streamlined and pleasant to the eye. And this is what you want the audience to see, not so much this. So we want to hide this from the audience. So if you're playing on this side, which is generally the side that I'm on, the audience is over here towards the door, you wanna have this facing away from them. And this could be anything from parallel to the floor to slightly down at an angle. Let's see if I can do this, where am I? So parallel to the floor to slightly down. If it's too far down and you lift the drum up or you have people sitting really close, they might still see it. So I like to say no more than 45, no higher than zero. This is step one, hiding the knot. Step number two is really simple and short. It's find the center line. So with my drum still and stationary, I'm going to find, if I look straight on top, a line that divides the drum evenly. We'll work from this, but this is step number two. Step number three is where we start to do the tying, and that's from the center line, identify the left side forward. So I've got my center line, and if I go left side forward of that center line, this rope is where the first hole is. This is where I want to start my tie. Again, center line, left side, forward, right here. 
If I have an Oketo strap with two different ties on it, I'm gonna take the one that's farthest away from me, as opposed to the one that's closest towards me, I'm gonna put that tie through the hole that I've identified as left forward. And then once I have that side forward, I'm gonna take the second tie and I'm gonna tie that to the hole on the left side that's closer to me. From here, I'm going to make an initial tie. It may not be where I actually want it in the end, but it's gonna keep the strap in place while I tie the other half. In terms of what knot I use, I generally tie this as I would my shoelace with an initial knot and then two little pretty bows after that. Step four, I'm gonna find that imaginary line again, but this time I'm gonna take the right side and I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna to go towards me. And I remember this by thinking, I'll be right back. I never say I'm gonna be left forward, but I often say, I'll be right back. That's how I remember left forward, right back. And it's even easier to find it in this case because I know this one here was my left forward line. So if I go over here, this is gonna be right back. Left was forward, right is back. There's my imaginary line. So this is where I'm gonna tie my first tie on the right side. And I'm essentially going to mirror what I've done on the left side with what I'm gonna do on the right side. So these holes are all the closest to each other, relatively speaking. And then again, once I have them through the holes or tied to the ropes, however, I will make an initial knot that gives me a starting point. And that brings us to step number five, which is putting it on. And I put that in air quotes or bunny ears because you're not actually gonna stand up and put it on. You're gonna have it over your shoulder and neck to get a, a initial feel of what it might feel like. And all it really means is getting your head under, having it go over your right shoulder, under your left armpit, and letting it hang a little bit. And even without your bocce, just getting an idea of letting it kind of settle. And if I was to hit it with bocce, imaginary bocce, does this feel anywhere near realistic? Or am I realizing right off the bat, oh yeah, this is, this is a little too high, or oh my God, this is so ridiculously low, I can't even reach it. You're gonna feel the, the bigger changes that need to be made right off the bat. And sometimes it's not about the height as it is about the tilt. You might find that it's way too far tilted down. It's not about the height. So you pull it up, pull it down and figure out what might be about the right range. But again, this isn't where you're going to do the final adjustments. This is the initial feel. And step number six, and the one you're going to get used to the most is adjust. You're probably, if you're new, especially, you're probably going to realize, oh, wow, that feels really weird. And you're going to want to start over. So you put it down. And sometimes you can tell this side is too low, this side is too high, you undo that and, and reset it. Um, this is why I recommend having a very, very easy to undo knot until you know for sure that you've got something secured. Because if you have to redo it and redo it and redo it and you've given, you've given yourself a really difficult knot, you're gonna start to hate yourself for it. So something simple to undo uh, while you make adjustments, whether it's a little more, a little less, whatever it is. Step six, adjust. And the final step, which is an unofficial seventh step, is to take everything we've done all this time through the fit and add on the hit. And this step is essentially getting into a default position and making sure that your bocce are in a good place in relation to the drum that you just fit on yourself. And all this really is, is getting your bocce and putting them in a default position to know that this is comfortable and relaxed. But if you're new to Katsugi Oketo or you haven't played it enough, you may not know what a default comfortable position is. So let's figure that out. We'll start with a very neutral position. My feet are shoulder wide, toes are pointed forward. My Oketo is parallel to the floor. Neither side is higher than the other. I'm going to take a slight step forward with my right foot. Nothing else changes. And then I'm going to let the hips turn while my attention is still focused this way. My head is focused this way. So I've got a 45 degree angle 
more or less with my hips and the drum and I'm going to let my weight stay on the back foot but this isn't comfortable so I'm going to let that back foot turn slightly in. I'm going to let the heel move in. My weight is somewhat on the back foot. I can push forward and back but that's more about footwork and we're not talking about that too much here. This is a default position where my weight is slightly back. From here, remembering everything we talked about with the hit, you know, bocce position and choke and center and blah, blah, blah. Just getting my arm nice and relaxed and making sure that it's at least parallel, maybe slightly in, maybe slightly out, maybe slightly down, but not, and this is important, not slightly up. I can't even really do that, but you don't want your tip of your bocce to force your uh, wrist to cock upwards. If my oketo is too high, and I need to do something like this. Take the oketo away. This is not a good position for my hand. This is uh, going to start straining, maybe even sprain, especially when I start playing for a long time with powerful hits. I want to be at a neutral, relaxed, or maybe even slightly lower position. Now, I will say sometimes the oketo on purpose is tilted up really severely, and it's played quite easily this way. You have a lot of access. And so, yeah, I can play this way, but my bocce is still held at this sort of angle. It's not being tilted up this way. This is what I want you to watch out for. So it's not the angle of the drum that's the issue. It's matching the angle by tilting your wrist up. This is what you want to avoid. Stay neutral or low. As for your left hand, again, going through all the things we did before, da 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 da, and I'm resting here. The most important thing here is the angle of the forearm. I want this to be at a slight angle downward, as if I had a drop of water that could, theoretically, draw down my arm. This means that I'm able to get more relaxation, I'm able to get more of a whip through than I would if I had to stop here. Whether my elbow was up or down, I have a parallel angle to the floor. This is not good. There are worse things. I, like I said, this thing with the wrist is much worse, but this is going to prevent you from getting a full strike through. You have to stop yourself early and it generally creates more tension as you have to stop early. If I did have, let's see, how do I do this? If I did have a higher oketo and I had to stop early, I could, I could play it. I could get away with it, but it's just not going to be as nice. It's not going to be as relaxed. It's going to stop me from having better technique. So again, relaxed arms. This is hanging with a little bit of adjustment and this is relaxed as if I was holding it against the rim, resting on the rim, but I'm a little bit off of that and I have a low angle with my wrist compared to my elbow. There are a lot of other things I can mention. There's a lot of nuance that I don't have the time to get across, but in general, stay relaxed. Arms are loose without the shoulders coming in, without the hunching going forward. You want to be able to stand upright and have your arms naturally, as natural as you can get with Katsuki Okero. You may find that there are better ways to do this, that there's a shortcut you can take, that someone else teaches you in a way that works better for you. But a lot of you haven't had someone talk you through this, and now you have a way that you can use as a default until you've learned something better. And who knows, maybe this is the best way for you. I hope it is, because then you got it. But there's no shortcut for practice and time on the Oketo. You might find that you've got a strap that feels right, you've got the tie, you've got the hit, everything feels good, and then months later you realize, huh, what if I do that? Or what if I do this? Or what if my bocce, you'll find things that work and change and make things better for you in the long run. But you have to start somewhere, and today we're starting somewhere. And now that you have it down, you can do the fun part, which is play. So there's your hit and your fit. These are two very general concepts that on a surface level are pretty easy to understand, but as you can see, you can drill down and understand a lot more. And once you become familiar and or comfortable with these aspects, your Oketo playing has an awesome foundation to propel you to all the wonderful, fun, exciting, and challenging things that you can have with Katsugi Oketo. So until next time, keep on practicing and be well.